Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Well, another reference by Paul that completely obliterates the Jesus myth theory. Dead in its tracks, as it were. Born of the seed of David according to the flesh. How much more explicit could Paul have been? But as we saw in the last few videos, these references, which are supposed to be showstoppers, are, as Earl Doherty calls them, frustratingly cryptic. They are not at all explicitly clear and unambiguous. We might wonder right off the bat if Paul hasn't once again used the Greek word genomai, where most translations have rendered the word born. Sure enough, if we peek under the hood, the actual Greek word in the actual Greek manuscripts is genomenu, which is another form of genomai, to be made or brought into existence, not genao. The actual word Paul used is made, not born. We saw this in the last video. But even so, this doesn't really explain everything. Why would Paul connect Jesus to King David in such a way, even metaphorically or figuratively. And what could he have possibly meant by according to the flesh if he didn't mean that Jesus was a real human being who was a genetic descendant of King David? It might be helpful to take a really quick tour, in fact, a whirlwind tour, of how the suffering Messiah idea came about and how King David got pulled into all of this. Before the Messiah, there were many messiahs. And I'm not talking about the first century. I'm talking about all the way back. Messiah, or Mashiach in Hebrew, along with several other forms of the word, simply means anointed. A couple of examples from the Old Testament include a Jewish king, Jewish priests, and prophets. But humans weren't the only messiahs. Here's an example of the Jewish temple and its utensils being anointed. And thou shalt take the anointing oil, and anoint the tabernacle, and all that is therein, and shalt hallow it, and all the vessels thereof, and it shall be holy. And just to show you that this word really does mean anoint, or to pour oil onto, let's have a quick peek under the hood of this verse. Heck, here's an example of unleavened bread as a messiah. And a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil, and their meat offering, and their drink offerings. Well, who would have thought that a piece of bread could not only show the Messiah, but be a Messiah? Being chosen by God was one thing, but being chosen to lead the people of Israel, that was something a piece of bread could not do. Since anointing with oil became so closely tied to Yahweh choosing special leaders, the word Messiah began to shift in meaning from simply anointed to something more like chosen one. This later became glorified as the chosen one. Not just a Messiah for our particular generation, but the Messiah for all time. The one who would not only lead the people and save them from their captors, but who would save them from their very own sins and even death itself. This ritual of pouring oil on a person's head was also carried out when Yahweh chose a young boy from Bethlehem as King Saul's replacement. Samuel anointed David's head with oil, and David, a young sheep herder, suddenly became king of all Israel. Of course, this couldn't be more fictional, but the point is he was anointed with oil, chosen by God, chosen to lead the Israelites, a Mashiach in the Hebrew tongue. But the idea of the Messiah came long before the first century BCE and has lasted even into the 21st century. Yes, there are still people today claiming to be the Messiah. But in the first two centuries leading up to the turn of the millennium, it soon became evident that none of the Messiah contenders were actually saving the Jews from their plights. They were all getting themselves killed. The idea that the Messiah would suffer and die instead of dominate the entire world came about, obviously, because all the would-be Messiahs, those hoping to rule as king over the Jews, were always getting themselves killed before attaining total world domination and a never-ending reign of greatness as the scriptures had prophesied 
This failure by the string of Messiah contenders was the necessary ingredient that led the losers to modify their beliefs so that it was not only cool to get killed if you were a Messiah, it was necessary. The fishers of Scripture needed only to look into Isaiah chapter 53 to see this suffering Messiah described in detail. Never mind that the grammar has the Messiah already dead during Isaiah's day. This passage was clearly describing the Messiah, the one who was to come, who would obviously die and die for the sins of the people. But the Messiah would not only get himself killed in glorious martyr fashion, but would rise victoriously from the icy clutches of death after a mere three days. And since Isaiah 53 is written in the past tense, many of the Christians of the first century would naturally view Jesus' sacrifice as happening sometime in the past, way in the past if Isaiah had already written of him as having died before his day. This is likely why Jesus was believed to have died sometime around when the world was made, or possibly even before. So the original idea of a king chosen by Yahweh, who would rule forever and establish the Jews as the dominant race, evolved into the idea that the Messiah would not establish an earthly kingdom, but would get himself killed for the sins of the people, and then rise from death, and later, at some appointed time, come back to earth, or appear for the first time, depending on what kind of Christianity we're talking about, and carry all of the faithful up into the clouds to be with him and his father Yahweh forever and ever. But what of King David? Why drag him into all of this? And where does this notion that the Messiah would be the seed of David come from? Why, the Jewish scriptures, of course, the same place where 99% of the details about Jesus comes from. Hath not scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David? and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? Before the gospel fictions were written, all of the details regarding Jesus came from the pages of Scripture, not the facts of history. If a passage could be twisted to say Jesus ate mangoes on Tuesdays, then that's obviously what he ate on Tuesdays. It wasn't enough just to say Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That wouldn't convince anyone. Scripture! on the other hand, seem to carry more weight than the actual facts did. Hath not Scripture said? Well, if Scripture hath said it, gosh, who are we to argue with that? But strangely, there is no place in Scripture that says explicitly that the Messiah will be of the seed of David. The author of John is simply stating a current belief of his day. So it's obvious that Christians somehow patched together enough disparate phrases from the Old Testament to create the idea of a Messiah. And that Messiah would somehow then be linked to the lineage of David. There is also no passage that explicitly says the Messiah will come from Bethlehem, coincidentally, the town where David grew up and in which he was presumably born. But there are threads here and there, passages that can be twisted and tied together in a kind of rope that leads up to these beliefs. And it's relevant to our discussion to have a look at where the idea might have come from. We know that Christians engaged in prophecy hunting, midrash as it's properly called. They sifted the old passages from the prophets and psalms in order to find some tiny nugget of information about Jesus, whom they had declared as the Messiah. And we know that the author of the Gospel of Matthew took this scripture sifting to a whole other level. One interesting example is the out of Egypt I have called my son prophecy, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Let's have a quick look at what this prophet actually wrote. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Never mind that the prophecy was about the ancient Israelites and how God saved them from slavery in Egypt. Never mind that the author of Hosea is referencing the story of God loving Jacob but hating Esau. Jacob, who later was renamed or nicknamed to Yisrael, meaning to wrestle with El. And never mind that Jacob died before the Israelites escaped Egypt which makes the important part a metaphorical reference to the entire offspring of Jacob, 
Matthew was wearing his prophecy glasses, and all he needed to see was God talking about his son in order to create a fictional scene in the life of Jesus. Now let's look at another verse that, with enough twisting, could be made to seem like it's talking about maybe Jesus being Lord over King David. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Matthew and company, eager to find Jesus in every Old Testament passage, found him right here. What? You can't see Jesus in that? With so much deliberate obfuscation of the original Hebrew names, it's hard sometimes to make sense of any of these translations. The trick is to see the first Lord as God, or more specifically, Yehovah, which is just good old Yahweh in disguise, and the second one as Jesus. Let's have a look at Young's literal translation. 